Hello. Today, I'm gonna ruin athleisure wear for you. Break. <laughs> Cause it turns out that not only are leggings not actual real pants. Am I good at football? No, leggings are not pants. But athleisure wear is killing the environment and killing fashion. Some of these clothes are polyester and um, I'll say synthetic fabrics. That also go into the waterway and chokes the fish and the marine um, life in there. Once 2020 happened and so many of us started working from home, on top of just our country's interest in sports and athletic activities, even if we're not the ones playing sports, we're just watching them on TV, it's no wonder that athleisure wear and sportswear has taken over our wardrobes. You know, looking into the future, you're gonna see a lot of athletic wear, a lot of athleisure. And that it's actually come to define American style in the 2000s. But before we get into the meat of this video where we talk about the history of athleisure wear and all of its problems, because there are several problems and issues, first I want to take a second to actually set the parameters about the definition of athleisure. Because while the first mention of athleisure is in a 1979 newspaper article from Nation's Business, the whole athleisure, a new term that's popped up, market, is in a state of tremendous growth, says John Gaybauer. Five years ago, we thought the industry would taper off after several years, but now we don't see an end in sight. Its definition can get a little wonky because for several years, there were several ways to interpret athleisure, even though we kind of understand what it means today. So with that in mind, here's how I am defining athleisure for this video. And that is that athleisure wear is the act and practice of wearing athletic or sporty style clothes clothing without having to have the intention of actually doing anything athletic. And while athleisure might feel new and like a representation of this particular moment in time, satorally speaking, it actually has a hundred year old history that has come to have a deep and profound impact on not only American fashion, but American technology, our environment, and also just our own physical health. And not necessarily for the better either. I wish you all to grab your most comfortable hoodie, sit back, relax, and come with me on this 100 year journey of athleisure wear because while the term was coined in 1979, the actual history of athleisure wear begins 100 years ago in the 19-teens and 20s. Sportswear has existed for hundreds of years, even if it doesn't necessarily look sporty to our eye. Now in the late 19th century, when we have this growing interest in athletics and sports and the popularity of tennis, golfing, bicycle riding, what have you, we do see a shift and a growing interest in sportswear as its own entity that is a little different than previous decades and centuries, especially for women. While I don't wanna dig into the history of sportswear specifically for women right now, because that is literally its own facet of history. It deserves its own video. And honest to God, in fact, we could do deep dives on like each sports influence on fashion and, and all that from tennis to bicycle riding to golf to horseback riding, all of it. So I'm not getting into that into this video, but I do just wanna lay the groundwork that so long as humans have had sports in our society, like we've had sports where. You know what I mean? But the reason I wanna go back specifically to the 19 teens and 20s is because it is in this moment that sportswear kind of did two very special and unique things. The first is that it is in the 19 teens and 20s that we see sportswear go from being worn for specific sporting events to being worn for casual clothes, as well as even semi-formal occasions. The second is that in the 19 teens and 20s is when we see wovens and plain woven fabrics no longer being used for sportswear and knits and specifically jerseys being worn for sporting clothing. And that, guys, is huge. Because if you look at all of our athleisure wear today and all of our sports wear today, it's all knit. And while knitting machines have existed since the 16th century and jersey has been used in clothing for hundreds of years, it wasn't really used for women's popular clothing regularly until like the 19 teens and 20s. While I don't like giving Chanel any more credit than the absolute bare minimum because she's a mediocre designer and a garbage person. And if you don't believe me, Nicole just released a video about all of these things and why Chanel is garbage. She did have a role to play in the popularization of Jersey for women's like casual clothing. 
Here is a quote from March 1919. Gabrielle Chanel is the name of the woman who made sports clothes the foremost feature of fashion from St. Moritz to Coronado Beach, from Manila Bay to Quebec. And while a lot of people might kind of associate Chanel with like the 1920s, thinking that that's kind of when she got her big break, the reality is, is she actually made a name for herself in the early 19-teens, right before the outbreak of World War One. And it is in 1913 that she actually released a midi blouse using a jersey that made her popular. So it became associated with her brand and her name. September issue of Vogue, 1914. The midi sweater of fine jersey, which was so successfully launched by Gabrielle Chanel last year, is still very smart. In that same article, though, they do go on to acknowledge that jersey has been used for clothing well before Chanel, like, put it in her collection. It's just, she jumped on the bandwagon and people liked that specific style that she did. People have gone quite mad about fine silk jersey, hats, sweaters, and entire costumes are sometimes made of it. But the silk sweater of today is totally different from the silk sweater that was popular two years ago. That was a very glossy, shiny silk, whereas the silk jersey, which is so much used this season, has a very dull finish and might even be mistaken at a glance for wool jersey. And while Chanel and other designers continue to use jersey throughout the 19-teens, it is in the early 1920s that we see jersey and sportswear being made out of jersey really take a hold of fashion and stop being worn for sporting occasions and strictly being worn for fashion and for fashion only. Here's a great quote from Women's Wear Daily about this exact phenomenon from September 1922. The fact that Washington is seriously adopting sports clothes for semi-formal occasions is of real importance in the world of fashion. You got that right. And early autumn finds many of the conservative set holding up their hands in horror at what our best people are coming to. So just for reference, this article is about what's being worn in Washington, D.C. by politicians and politicians' wives. So this isn't actors or debutantes or socialites or women of fashion. It's not supposed to be like a representation of in-the-moment fashion, but actually kind of slow-moving fashion. Mrs. Thomas Walsh and the example set by her, her coterie of diplomatic personnel during the past summer are largely responsible for the innovation. All through the months while Congress awaits adjournment, this social leader was hostess on more than one occasion to members of the diplomatic corps on her houseboat. First, her guests could not get accustomed to following literally the request, please wear sports clothes. The men would compromise by appearing in black dinner jackets with white trousers. The women would don the most expensive and elaborate afternoon frocks. But when Mrs. Walsh persistently appeared in black and white sports skirts, white silk striped sweaters, and a black and white sports hat, gradually the women fortunate enough to receive invitations to these evening parties began to do likewise. The decks blossomed into veritable fashion parades of knit goods, silk and wool, the sweaters vying with the colors of the spectrum, or glowing like a mammoth textile color card. And it's actually also in this same article that, because they're continuing to kind of talk about the trend of sportswear, where they actually go on to describe this wearing of sportswear in these sort of semi-formal occasions as semi-sports attire. And I can't help but feel that that's just a really great antiquated way to say athleisure because that ultimately is like what athlete leisure wear sort of is, you know? Another thing that I find fascinating about the 19 teens and 20s moment is also how we have this establishment of a few great athleisure wear, like heritage American brands. The first one's actually Champion, which originally was founded as the Knickerbocker Knitting Company in 1919, and it eventually changed its name to Champion in the 1930s. The other brand is actually Converse. The Converse rubber shoe company started in 1908, and they launched their first basketball shoe, which I think looks familiar enough to everybody in 1917. From there, we continue to still have the traditional Converse basketball shoe as almost a staple of everyone's wardrobe. While the term athleisure hadn't been coined yet by the 19 teens and 20s, it is these decades where we see the foundations and the origin story of what would become athleisure in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. <laughs> Hello? Oh, yes, this is she. Fair enough, I can give that to them. Yeah, have a good one, bye. So the 1970s called, 
and they want their credit back. Well, I've already mentioned this once, but the first documented use of the term athleisure seems to be in March of 1979 in a Nation's Business article that is completely devoted to the discussion of sportswear and the rising popularity of athleisure wear. It's in 1975 that we see the foundation of the Association of Physical Fitness Centers as a way to kind of pinpoint the rise and popularity of fitness center memberships. It was so popular in the 1970s that even Arnold Schwarzenegger went on the record in this newspaper article to state that he believed that there would be more fitness centers by 1985 than there are actual like grocery stores. And while he wasn't, I think, necessarily right at the right time, seeing as how there's literally a Anytime Fitness, an Orange Theory, and a Pure Bar all within the same parking lot. Like you can see all three of them in my hometown. I don't think he's wrong now. He was just a few decades off, you know what I mean? And this boom in going to the gym and working out and playing sports is a huge contributor, surprising no one, to the rise of sportswear and the popularity of wearing athleisure. The booming popularity of fitness has given birth to a similar boom in apparel and footwear designed for those who actually participate in sports and those who just want to look as if they do. And this popularity means huge numbers when it comes to retail. Sports footwear and clothing have annual retail value of about 243 million and 3.8 billion dollars respectively, according to the Sporting Goods Manufacturers Association. So that's, that's billions in 1970s inflation money, not in 2020s inflation money, you know what I mean? The article actually goes on to state, a major department store chain recently found that about 70% of the sports apparel it sells is bought for purposes other than sports. So, athleisure. And while, yes, this article was written in 1979, the trend for wearing sportswear and athletic apparel without the intention of actually participating in any sports or physical activity was a well-established trend throughout the 70s. In fact, in an August 1973 issue of Essence, they have a whole spread devoted to collegiate fashion, and one of the pages is simply devoted to the warm-up suit. Warm-up suits, or track suits, whatever you wish to call them, were hugely influential when it comes to the rise and popularity of sportswear as athleisure wear, and they quickly became a wardrobe staple for American fashion in the 70s. Just two years after that Essence article, we have actual physical numbers about how well the warm-up suit trend is doing for the apparel industry. The under $30 warm-up is the future of the business, predicts Stephen Malice, president of Chrissy Everett for Puritan. Chrissy Everett was a pretty famous tennis player in the 1970s, and she was definitely sort of a lead in this whole idea of athletes being like trendsetters and like lending their name to like sport, sport apparel. He goes on to say, and frankly, the more warm-ups we see in the supermarket, that is warm-ups being worn everywhere, the more we like it. Well, that makes sense, you're selling product. And with this growing interest in sportswear and warm-up suits, coupled with America's interest in innovation and technological fabrics, becoming less and less interested in natural fibers, we start to see the origins of the harm that the athleisure wear industry will bring to the environment as well as the fashion industry. Warm-ups today have really become more stylish. Women want to wear them everywhere, not just on the court or to jog, so we're providing them with a more universal fashion appeal. To do this, Winning Waist is using more acrylic knits and polyester, leaving the once basic nylon warm-up for the unisex crowd. The most popular fabric at Loom Togs is an acrylic with fleece backing. New and important additions have been velour, terry cloth, and polyester knit. And so it's here that we see capitalism is just starting to get its gears going, to get its hands on the whole concept of warm-up gear, to develop new and technological innovative fabrics out of polyester and other chemicals and synthetics in order to appeal to a broader athleisure wear wearing market. Which then opens the door perfectly to discuss what happened in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. The industry which has brought new life to Camden is the DuPont Company, which manufactures a new synthetic fiber called Orlon. To the surprise of no one, the athleisure boom continues throughout the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, especially once we have the yoga boom of the early 2000s. That's when athleisure wear just completely takes off, and frankly, athleisure and yoga pants kind of become synonymous for a while. And with this surge in popularity comes innovation. And while one would hope that innovation would equal good things, 
Unfortunately, this was during a time when sustainability and innovation did not go hand in hand. And it is here that we start to see a different story of athleisure unfold, one of destruction and harm that has lasted for 30 years. And while traditional fabric manufacturing for natural materials like cotton, linen, silk, and wool have gone out of business and we've even lost a lot of that heritage technology, synthetic materials and man-made fabrics have been in a boom thanks to athleisure and as a result have dumped millions and upon millions of tons of microplastics into our waterways over the past 30 years. Additionally, because synthetics just don't hold up as well as natural materials, it has forced us, the consumer, to buy more and more of these goods because they just simply don't last as long as natural fabrics do either. And what I didn't even realize until I started researching this video was what sort of impact athleisure wear has actively had on our fabric manufacturing industry as well as our environment. And to put it quite simply, Athleisure wear is killing the environment. According to the European Environment Agency, between 16 and 35% of all microplastics in our waterways comes from our clothing. And between 200 to 500,000 tons of microplastics that get dumped into our waterways every year come from textiles alone. And while of course not all of these microplastics are coming from athleisure wear, we also cannot deny that the popularity of athleisure and active wear has been a huge contributing factor in all of this environmental waste and damage. And why is that? Because of all those technical innovations in fabrics and textiles to help propel the athleisure wear market forward and keep it viable and interesting. So polyester, the fabric that literally haunts our nightmares, sweat glands, and waterways, was actually invented in the 1930s by DuPont, which is a chemical company that is also known for great environmental innovations like styrofoam. Love that. It was actually in 1951 where DuPont launched Dacron polyester fiber and that they started to build a manufacturing facility in North Carolina to produce polyester fiber to make clothing. DuPont's Camden plant was begun in 1949 and completed early in 1953. Representing a $50 million investment, the manufacture of Orlon is one of DuPont's latest ventures in the production of synthetic fibers, which have revolutionized the textile world. Fast forward about 35 years to 1986, we see this article from Women's Wear Daily announcing that DuPont is developing a new polyester fiber specifically for the athleisure wear market. And they included brands like Janssen, Oshkosh Bagosh, and Nike. The growth and popularity of athleisure wear directly coincides with fabric manufacturers focusing on creating proprietary innovations in fiber technology and leaving off natural fibers and focusing on using buzzwords like this one. The first season Moret is making Everlast Women's, the line includes a wider selection of technical fabrics and even incorporates them into some of the athleisure looks. Many of the offerings have Cool Max, an Everlast proprietary ever dry fabric. And this demand for technical fabrics actively harmed the natural fiber and textile mills, threatening to put them out of business unless they were able to adapt to this sort of demand. As the sizzling athleisure trend spreads through the most elite echelons of fashion, Italian mills are finally jumping on the category's lucrative bandwagon. Brace yourself, guys. This next part's gonna be a little rough, both for pronunciation and what I'm getting ready to tell you. Telegno 1900 unfurled the Rainmaker, a collection of fabrics that it says bridges the gap between between formal and technical. Woolen fibers were enriched with polyurethane or polyurethane graphite membranes, jersey backing made of viscose or elasticated nylon and water repellent finish. And you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Fellow wool mill, Retta, 1865, based in Baella, Baella? Baella? <laughs> I don't think Italian. Italy, unfurled Reta Active, which the company said infuses its elegant look with an enhanced level of comfort. Its key trait is its thermoregulating warm sense yarns. Utilizing one of the most technologically advanced fabrics the company has ever invested in. Guys, it's wool. That's literally what wool does. That's literally what wool is known for is its thermoregulating properties. What is even happening right now? What the hell are you talking about? Mm. Give me a second. Do you guys want to know the reason? for that shift away from just natural wool fabric manufacturing at leisure. 
And millennials, because we're blamed for everything, baby. Millennials, destroying everything since the 1980s. As larger players like Under Armour, Nike, Adidas, and Puma continue to woo millennials who are not willing to splurge on wool suits and refined knits. Excuse me? When have I ever lived in an economy that has actually made that like a viable option? I definitely couldn't afford that shit in 2016. Italian mills will be under pressure to continue to develop and embrace performance wear. It's almost immediately after that 2016 article about those heritage mills going into like active wear and innovative technology, we see this sort of pushback and this growing interest in sustainability to the point that even in a 2018 article that I found about fabric manufacturing, some of these same mills are talking about how important sustainability is and like going back to their traditional like wool manufacturing technology. It's kind of like a Pandora's box. Once we've made the innovation innovation, it's, it's kind of out there. It's not like we can fully go back. And now we have to deal with the ramifications of what has happened. In this prenda is the polyester. Now, what is the polyester? It's just a polymer synthetic that has a time of biodegradation of many years in comparison to algodon. So here's the thing, guys. It also turns out that the chemicals they're using to, to dye and to create athleisure wear clothes can make us sick. Cool. So in a 2015 article from The Guardian about this subject, they reported that Greenpeace had released a study reporting on how many hazardous chemicals they actually found in World Cup jerseys and fan merchandise. While this report did help encourage brands like Adidas and even eventually Nike to phase out polyfluorinated chemicals or PFCs from their clothing, it still begs to question, one, how many of us are still wearing garments with these PFCs? Like I'm pretty sure these pants from 2016, my Space pants. Look at my pants with the eyes in your face. My legs are covered in outer space. Space pants. Probably have PFCs in them. We just assume that it's safe because it's on our bodies, but the reality is, is that we just simply don't know. Levi's jeans are the most successful branded item of clothing ever designed. In the first hundred years of the firm's existence, they sold a hundred million pairs. So have you noticed that in like the past 10 years or so that the quality of blue jeans and like the denim quality in jeans has gotten progressively worse? Athleisure's to blame for that. Women's jeans were pressured as comfortable items like stretch yoga pants were picking up some of the business previously held by premium jeans. The athleisure category is on fire, and that's where a lot of the premium business has gone, says Chip Berg, CEO of Levi's. The women's jeans business is pretty healthy at $30 and below, and we think that we can capture some of that even though we're a bit late, with concepts such as more moderately priced stretch fabrics. And this decline actually continues throughout 2014 with Women's Wear Daily running an article about how the men's denim department and sector is having hugely negative impacts from athleisure, with sales being down 2.5%. We use and abuse the term athleisure. Why are athletic brands like Under Armour doing so well? What can a denim company learn from that, says Tim Collins, men's manager of Lee's Jeans. They want comfort. It's nothing new, he said. When it comes down to it, we're unlocking the comfort equation, which for us, is stretch. And it's in this article where we can see the moment where brands are starting to incorporate these technical fibers and stretch materials in order to be competitive with athleisure at the detriment of denim itself. And in keeping with the sub-theme of this video, which is DuPont is the blame for everything, in 2018, DuPont launched a new polyester fiber called Sonora, which was their more eco-friendly and sustainable fiber option because it's 37% plant-based materials, it uses a fermentation process, Process, but specifically for denim, it holds up better to wear and tear and does a better job maintaining its elasticity so it can help denim with their athleisure wear and comfort problem. Gee, thanks DuPont, you're the best. But I, I think this is all just a bunch of crap. So where is denim at now? I'm having a hard time really kind of putting my finger on it because I haven't found a lot of articles addressing this specific issue since like the 20, very early 2020s. And with the pandemic and everything, it just kind of changed how the market was operating anyways. What I will say, what I have noticed just from like people talking about fashion online is I'm seeing a bigger push of interest in heritage denim brands, quality denim, vintage denim, and people really wanting to invest money in a pair of denim jeans that will last for years and years and years. And 
And this paper thin quality, this overly stretched denim, especially since we're moving away from skinny jeans, just doesn't seem to be the thing anymore. So the final nail in this coffin of how like athleisure wear has killed fashion is just the fact that there are so many celebrities in this day and age that have jumped onto this athleisure wear party train in order to make a buck while also still kind of calling themselves fashion designers. When the reality is all they're doing is lending their face and their name to another corporation who's again, just trying to make a buck. One of probably the most famous instances of this is Kate Hudson and Fabletics, which is developed through Just Fab. To me, Fabletics has really become the poster girl For athleisure. of this. I feel like we did have a big part of that because, you know, our growth was quite strong and fast. And it's done so well that they've actually opened up 90 stores, which frankly to me in this day and age of malls are dying and everyone buys clothing online right now, the fact that they're so confident in their business model and their income and retail sales and revenue that they're willing to open up 90 storefronts just in at leisure, that says a lot. What's the design process for you in Fabletics? Like? Well, it depends on what it is. What we do is we shift up the fashion, we shift the style up. There's no design in athleisure. Leggings have been leggings since they were invented. In fact, you can find patterns to make your own leggings, tank tops, sports bras, and t-shirts online for free right now. There's nothing innovative about leggings. You either have them fitted all the way down, they can be shorter, they can be longer, they can be high-waisted, they can be low-waisted, they can have a thick waistband, they can have a narrow waistband, they can have a thermoplastic glow band that will just make your tummy flatter, apparently. That's a bunch of bullshit. You know, tank tops are tank tops. Like, extra straps? That's not design, that's just trying to put makeup on a cow like it's the, it's there's nothing interesting actually about athleisure wear that's my point and everyone believes that athleisure wear is the thing of the moment and like this big moment in fashion but it actually is killing fashion because there's nothing actually interesting about athleisure wear all it has done is pollute our waterways destroy heritage brands like levi's and making having them make shitty quality denim and then we all look the same because we're all just wearing the same colored pants it's all black leggings and the fact that lululemon thinks that they're gonna make $12.5 billion in revenue sales by 2026 is just a huge problem. They are selling black leggings for over $100. Look, I'm a millennial. You can drag my black leggings out of my cold, dead, gnarly hands when I am in my 90s at the old folks home. I will always have black leggings in my wardrobe because I think that they're comfortable and I wear them when I wish to be comfortable. But I'm not gonna kid myself when I say that athleisure wear has done a great amount of harm in our fashion industry. And I think that harm and that monotony and that boring quality, that just mass manufactured, repetitive, robotic, factory feeling look of athleisure wear is honestly going to go down as the greatest representation of fashion in the early 21st century. I, I'm not here to judge people for wearing athleisure wear. I wear athleisure wear. I'm literally wearing athleisure wear right now. These are my clothes. Athleisure wear has a moment. It has a purpose and that is in practical clothing because we as humans have always worn practical clothing when it makes sense and when we are at home and we're not seeing people, we wear comfortable clothing. Like we've done that for hundreds of years. Leisure wear ultimately is our 21st century variation of that same thing. The problem is the fact that people keep pushing it as something that is fashion when ultimately it is not. And the only way that they're able to continue to innovate athleisure wear is by creating new technical fabrics, which are doing nothing more than actually harming our environment and polluting our waterways. So I guess like the question is, is like, is athleisure gonna actually like go away eventually? Are we gonna start to see the decline of athleisure? I don't know where the future of athleisure is going to go, but I do know that the past 40 years, it has actually caused a lot of problems. And so with that in mind, I do honestly kind of hope that it evolves and changes and we kind of push away from it in some capacity. You know, at least to garments that are made out of natural fibers and can biodegrade and you know, not last for like, millennia 
in our landfills and in trash piles. But I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Because at this moment in time, athleisure wear, in, in my mind, is like a fashion historian. Like, if I think about it, I think in like 100 years time, historians are going to look at the early 21st century and the, this kind of 50 year time span as like the decades of athleisure wear and the decades of spandex and and leggings and tank tops. And they're going to go, what happened? <laughs> Why are people wearing this when fashion came to die? But with that, I do hope that you all enjoyed this video. And if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up. At the very least, the fact that I just said that, you should see like a little rainbow thing around the thumbs up thing, which is, I don't know. I saw that the other day and I thought that was really cool. And uh, also, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do so. We like to talk about fashion and history, fashion history, as well as just other sort of related topics around history and culture and society. And so with that, my friends, thank you so much for joining me on this video and I'll see you back here next time with another one. Bye. Subi, do you want to hang out? You can come over here. You'll be in the shot. Do you want to walk on the treadmill? Sir. Preppy, no. no. What do you want to do? Okay, bye, Sue. Up. 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 You can do it. Yeah. Good girl. He sit. He wait. Good girl. Stay there, okay? Just wait. Wait. No, wait, 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 wait. Good girl, wait. Just wait, it's okay. No, 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 wait. Stay. Let's take good table, Soupy, okay?